Hello, everyone, and welcome to Visual Radio. It is Tuesday, October 11th, 20 days away from Halloween, Gallagher. I don't care much about Halloween. <laughs> My guest today is Gallagher. I don't think it's a good idea to let your kids go door to door late at night asking strangers for something to put in their mouth. I agree with you 100%. Now, if your kids don't come home, you can't tell the cops what they look like because they were in a costume. And then every year, all the kids want to wear the same costume. It'll be Power Rangers or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or them little yellow pillars from Japan. I don't know what they're called, but um, it's just a very dangerous holiday. Even more so in Boston, because now the, cost, the big costume is Whitey Bulger, uh -huh. the gangster. Yeah. They're selling like hotcakes. An orange jumpsuit with Whitey on the back? It's... it's you know, it's kind of controversial. The victims of uh, his crimes are not happy about it. And, um, and it well, gets... I didn't think Halloween was about making people happy. Huh? You're supposed to scare them. Well, the candy makes them happy. I don't get it. I, I, how do you scare kids and then give them candy? You're supposed to teach kids not to take candy from strangers. So You're I don't absolutely get the whole right. holiday doesn't make a bit of sense. Well, me being into Lugosi, it makes sense for me. What brings you up to Boston? I know you're in Connecticut. You're doing some gigs, Mohegan Sun. It's a major airport. I need to fly to major airports and then drive to the small towns. Otherwise, you have to fly in and out of small towns. Too much trouble. I love Wolfstown, where you are on the weekend. Um, Peter Noons played there, Mark Farner from Grand Funk Railroad. In fact, we interviewed him down there at the Mohegan Sun in the, the Wolfstown. It's just a lovely venue. I'm working all the places I didn't have to work on the way up. I'm working my way down. Actually, it's a prestigious room. Oh, it is? It is. It's a good room. I didn't know that. Yeah, and you're there two nights, so you're going to love it. Yeah. yeah. And they've got all the, the casino stuff happening out there, so there's a lot of noise and sound, but then in the Wolf's Den, it's nice. There isn't a lot of sound in a casino anymore. That without the coins, you don't have that excitement of winning and uh, the only fun is over at the dice table. So I've invented a new dice game where you can play baseball with dice. Uh, you see, I'm an innovator. I'm a visionary. I, I wouldn't even know how to begin to explain. play baseball, baseball with, with dice. dice. Yeah. Well, um, like a seven is a single, 11 is a double, and a 12 is a triple. You see, you throw the dice and you move it around and there's two teams of dice players and they're kind of cheering and the girls are wearing sporty little outfits, maybe stripes like umpires and you get popcorn and there's fun out there. I, I'm also redoing the software in slot machines. Well, I, to go back to your baseball, I thought that you take a book and you hit the dice like a you no, know, no. And you, you name don't do Andrew anything Dice like and... that. No, but I am doing a slot machine where the d a pitcher pitches the dice and then you hit them and then that's how they get thrown. And do you, you put the nickel in or you press the button and run back with your Well, bat? there's no money anymore. Oh. You know, you put your card in and then they know how much money you lost and then you win a free buffet. <laughs> it's silly. A free buffet at the casino. Yeah, what happens is everybody loses the money that they had planned on losing They right away. Then they wander around looking for coupons and free things. And what I'm doing is giving them more fun in the machine, in the gameplay. And of course, the casino's against it because they want it to go really fast. But what's the sense of being all done if they're wandering around with no entertainment value and the machine's sitting there by itself, you see? They don't, I'm a visionary. I'm trying to tell them how to do business. What's the matter with people having more fun? They should get a little exercise down there. Jay and I were down there for the Peter Noon show and I won 55 bucks and I walked away. Mm -hmm. I figured stay ahead of the game, right? Well, you could have won 5,000, you never know. That's, yeah. it's selling hope. When I go in these uh, gas stations to get me a coffee or something mm -hmm. while I'm on the road, the people in front of me are buying Hope. They're buying this kind of ticket, that kind. They, there's always this chance that they're going to change their lives and be rich. And that's what we sell in America, is we sell hope. Like the Roseanne show. She won, right? She, she well, won she didn't need to win. She already had money. But on the game, on the, on the show, she, they won oh, the ticket. Oh, on her show? Yeah. Oh, I've never watched her show. I haven't either, but I read about things. Yeah. 
<laughs> so Boston, do you have any memories of playing in Boston establishments to Orpheum or mm. Orpheum's up there on Tremont Street? Now, the first time I went around America, you see, I told you, I got famous right away. My third job in show business was opening for Kenny Rogers 100 shows all around the country. That's amazing. Well, I met his manager at a time when the manager was starting a new uh, management company and they needed a comedian. And he told me that he could let me open for Kenny for 100 shows. At $5,000 a show was a half a million dollar deal. Whoa. So I learned about America by introducing uh, the opening act Dottie West all around the country. And I could compare the cities and Detroit was the bottom and Las Cruces, New Mexico was the top. You wouldn't think that, would you? No, they were not a, at all. They were a wonderful crowd. I had the best time. Rockford, Illinois came in second. Minneapolis came in third. Boston, I don't know. Now, this is Kenny after first edition, or was it oh, Kenny Oh, yeah, Rogers? this is 8081. Okay. This is Lady, da, 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 and you decorated my life. Which are good pop tunes. Oh yeah, they loved them. The, but you see, if you're going to work a 10,000 seater, it takes a while for them all to sit down. So at about a quarter to eight, there's 5,000 people there. Well, I went out and I started entertaining them and, and seating them. And I tell these people to go sit there and those people and you're wearing funny clothes and don't walk in front of your wife, uh, you know, help her and don't, leave, you know, watch your kids and everything. And so then they knew me. Uh, and that's the best thing to do is to get an audience to like you and then tell them jokes rather than come straight out telling jokes. So then I'd introduce Dottie about 10 after 8. Instead of doing a half an hour and then introducing Dottie, I, tell, I told Dottie, don't you want to go out there when they're fresh? Because, see, I'm going to smash. And I don't want her walking around in her high heels in, in something that might, she might slip. So I'd introduce her about 10 after so I'd done 25 minutes already. She'd do her half an hour, and then as she was exiting, I'd pop back up into her spotlight, you see, as she was leaving, and then I'd do my sledge -matic. and then they loved it, and so I was actually the opening and the closing act of the first half of the show, because Kenny wouldn't show up until the intermission. He'd fly in, in his airplane, so he didn't know anything about what I was doing. You decorated his stage. I did. With the sledge -matic. now. Well, his stage was a bunch of uh, lunchroom tables in a square. And then he'd put the band in the middle of that, and then he'd parade around. So everybody had a front row seat, you see, a lot of them. And uh, so it was hard for me to pick a corner, because I'd have to ignore the other corner. I can't smash at all four corners. So it was hard for me. Who was the manager back then? Well, it was Ken Cragen. Ken Cragen. I forgot the name. See, I'm getting blue Well, timers. but yeah, the problem with Ken was he got the idea that everybody in America should hold hands. Uh, hands across America. So I always felt funny calling him to ask about my act because uh, I knew he was doing more important things, uh, making everybody hold hands or feeding everybody in Africa. And it felt weird. And so uh, after I did them 100 jobs, uh, I, I didn't stay with that company anymore. And I, but I learned from Kenny how to promote your own shows. And so then I rented the theaters and paid the stagehands and bought the advertising for decades, 20, 25 years. So I never had an agent or a manager. Kenny had a great book out, Making It in Music. It was really precise you know there's tons of books out there but Kenny Rogers from the School of Hard Knocks mm -hmm. I knew his first manager when he was in the new Christie Minstrels mm -hmm. the late George Greif but Kenny Cragen's a legend that's amazing so you have a book in you we talked about this yesterday there is a book in there I mean just the story of the sledge I don't think people read so I think that if they just got my four DVD set available on eBay, now, Amazon, now we don't talk about those things okay. on this show. <laughs> well, I don't make any money. They've already been sold. They're just okay. selling them uh, used. You know, the kids uh, copy them and then sell the original. That that's interesting. That's a good point. 
because we're public access, but you don't make any money. No. So eBay is just people trading. No, I'm stuff. just yeah. saying that my whole life is available. People can just look at it. But I'm a person and I read, I'm, you know. You're unusual. Well, that's... You have glasses on top of your head. You're going to be reading. But most people, I don't think... I think people read on the train going into New York. But I, I don't think that generally the population reads. I don't think they even multiply. They say things like, if you want to do the math, because it's too hard for them. And it just must be too hard. They, you know what's popular? Those books that are read for blind people. They like to put Braille. The, yeah, they put those in uh, uh, when they drive and have a book read to them. Oh, I thought the blind people were driving and reading at the same time. No, oh, no, don't. those books for people that uh, just listen. The Braille. No, you listen with the, the the headphones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's CD versions of books, and there's um, sometimes the author reads them. Sometimes they have someone read them. But I think your story is interesting. Well, we're turning into just uh, sitting down people and the kids never exercise, they don't eat right, and they just play video games, or um, they're online playing with their, their little phones, and they're not exercising. We're not a wild country anymore. Well, you're on the road constantly. Do yes. You, do you come up with bits as you see people in different areas? Oh, I have to. People yeah. have to feel like you're one of them. Otherwise, you're from out of town. Mm -hmm. And then they don't cotton to you. See, you got to know the lingo and how they talk. It's very, to me, comedy is extremely intimate. That's why I don't go around the world. I don't know them people. Mm -hmm. They're foreigners. Europe's full of them. And uh, they just aren't my folks. In fact, I don't really go to L.A. or New York. They're just different. I don't know them folks. I stay in the space in between. I like little small towns. When, the, when you show up, you're the only thing happening. They all, everybody's there. I've had the mayor at my shows innumerable times. Does that help him get elected? Well, it's something <laughs> happening in town. No, no, it like makes it. sense. I remember when I was in Toledo, the mayor showed up. It was a woman, and she gave me the key to the city, and it wasn't even the key. It was a glass. Well, that's still... Because they're the glass capital of the world, home of the Jeep. I did not know that. Well, this is now what... Now I do. I, I do research as I'm going around, so I know where I am and what's... I ask people, has there been a some kind of scandal in town late, lately. What's the mayor been doing? What's the police chief doing? And then you mention it and people are all excited that you cared about them enough to learn about their town. That's important. It is. I put your name in Google to get your website and it comes right up. So if you put Gallagher in Google. I'm the top response. It takes a lifetime to do that. I'm, and, and I get to have that. Of course, I have to be 65 years old with hardly any hairs left, but I am the top response. I think you can buy that, but I don't pay for it. Right. You've just been touring, and, and it kind of just Well, for a long there. time, this electric fence company from Australia was the top one. Did you know every electric fence has the name Gallagher on it? I guess the cows can't read, but there it is. In fact, the... Um, Trolleys out in San Francisco are also made by a company named Gallagher, and Gallagher's on all the trolleys. I pay attention to that. I'm proud. I went to uh, Ireland to go back to where I started, my family started, in Donegal. Uh, Gallagher, I think, is the 11th most popular name in Ireland. And, of course, it's the most popular in Donegal because that's where we're from. We're mercenaries. You can hire us to kill people. We don't have any skills, artists, or we don't make things, but we will uh, wield an axe. The Gallagher mercenaries. Now, did you go to the library and look up? Oh, yeah. I wanted to know about myself. My grandmother was carried away uh, in Pittsburgh. Now, I, most of the Gallaghers are in Pittsburgh. There's uh, just, you know, maybe 20 Gallaghers in any city, but you go to Pittsburgh, there's page after page after page of Gallaghers. I think they came over to work in the mines, in the coal mines, because okay. they worked in the coal mines in Ireland, I think. But my uh, grandfather was a little man, 
and he wanted to be a, an adagio dancer. And so he whisked my grandmother off her feet and he taught her to rub rose petals on her cheeks. I guess they didn't have makeup back then. And smoke cigarettes. And okay. that's what she told me. And so he left her after a while. I guess she was pregnant. It was his fault. But he did marry her. That was good. So I've got the name legally. Right. And uh, that's, uh, that's, I guess, where I got my show business was from this little guy named Gallagher. What was his first name? Do you remember? Francis. Francis Gallagher. Yeah. <laughs> it's a girl name. Well, Frank. Yeah. But what's happened in America is the girls are taking the boy names. You ah. know, that used to be a rare thing if you were named like Connie Mack. Remember Connie was a sure. boy name uh, I mean, uh, for some reason. But now Jamie, Jesse, Jody, these names can all go both ways. Ashley was the male lead in Gone with the Wind, and that's a girl. I See, I, I sign a lot of autographs, and so then I notice that the girls want to be named Sam for some reason, the, uh, you know, like a fat plumber. Uh, they name them Samantha to call them Sam, Alexandra to call them Alex, Tony, even Tony now, the mob is pissed. You can't uh, even be Tony anymore. They took the Y off of the end, then they put an I. And Tony that Collette. It, the that makes sense. it a girl. Yeah. She's a great actress. Well, you can give examples of, yeah, just about everyone. But Dale, I remember when I used to watch Roy Rogers, his wife was named Dale. And I thought, well, that's a boy name. Oh, Cowboy, Dale Evans. Tony, the big hurt. Tony, I just had it. 60s. Yeah. Tony, not Oh, Fisher. I don't remember anything about the 60s. Uh, that was uh, LSD. I think I was on a trip until the 70s. You were in the infamous TMZ for yeah. collapsing on stage. Yeah. You're okay. Well, I, you can't tell when your pump is broke, you know. It could stop any time. It's terrible. God, put your heart right next to your stomach so you can't tell if you're about to die or need to... Oh, okay. Collapsing on his back and clutching his chest. It wasn't part of the act. Now, you can watch the video on YouTube. I was not clutching my... I there's a video, okay. I know, yeah. Oh, there oh. were three of them, but wow. the, they took two of them down. I just felt tired, you know. They say that a, a heart attack feels like somebody sitting on your chest, but I had that, and it didn't feel like that. So it was a heart attack? Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, it was my second heart attack. I had one in 2000, and then uh, one in March. So, I mean, I'm on borrowed time. You're lucky you're getting me here today. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. And, and again, that was in where? Minnesota. Oh, I was 5.3 miles from the uh, Mayo Clinic. I was very lucky because I had spent 12 days going around the world entertaining the Navy. I had been on the aircraft carrier Carl Vincennes, where they took Osama bin Laden's body or ashes or whatever. Were you there when they did that? No, but I, I was there a little before it, and I was in Bahrain. I had a, a show canceled because they switched from rubber bullets to real bullets. That's what they came and told me. Said, well, they're using real bullets now. You're not going to go on tonight. Whoa. Yeah. Michael Jackson wasn't but there. But that involved three 13-hour flights. Now, I could have had a heart attack during those, and I'd have died on the plane because there was no way to... One was going across the Pacific, another flight was going across China and, and Russia to get to Islamabad. I was in uh, the, the airport there, and you know, when I see an Arab uh, at the airport, I don't want to get on that plane, but I was at an airport where I was the odd one. Nobody wanted to get on because I was there. I didn't know that we could fly over China now. We can fly over China and Russia. There's no way to get from Japan to, to Islamabad without going over China. Maybe we did go up and around. It took 13 hours. Then the last flight was from Madrid over the North Pole, kind of, and then down into Dallas. I didn't even go to New York. I came to Dallas. From the, the From Madrid. Amazing. It Whoa. is. It's a round world. I wonder what the uh, airplanes, uh, the magnetics happen when they go on the North Pole. Is it, does the plane 
jitter or anything, or everything's just... Well, I don't think the North Pole is at the North Pole. Right. It's, all, it's always moving. Well, yeah. It's but it's only else. like a few feet or whatever. Oh, no. It's miles and miles and miles. It moves? I study physics and geology. I have the whole day free. I don't have a job. So oh, yes, I, you have a job. No, I just go to a bar at night and tell jokes I would have told anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I picked a job you can do drunk. And you have. And I have. It's a blood thinner. Rather than spend a lot of money on Plavix, I just have a shot of tequila. Well, that's the beauty of knowing physics. It is. So do you employ the physics in your routine? No, it isn't any good. You know, you have to go to the lowest level. And in a bar with a bunch of drunks, you can't be too smart. You're not going to connect. One of, 